Yeah, so as she said, I'm here to talk about infrastructure as data, domain modeling for your deployments. So most of the people in this room are probably familiar with the idea of infrastructure as code, where we're, we're writing software, it's a deployable artifact that manifests as servers running somewhere, doing whatever it is that we tell them to do. The problem with that is that it can be prone to procedural logic where you just say, do this, then do this, then do this, which ends up being brittle, inflexible, and it's easy to write at first for the day zero concerns, but as you go into a maintenance cycle of trying to manage and evolve these services over months and years, it starts to become a problem, and so then you start reaching for something else, and I'm here to say that that something else might be data, infrastructure is data, where you're treating your infrastructure as a stateful service using principles of data management and data evolution and trying to bring in different aspects of evolutionary design so that rather than trying to write everything as one monolithic deployable piece of infrastructure, you try to componentize it. And as I said, day zero, it's easy to go with infrastructure as code, whereas trying to establish a domain model and understand what your abstractions are, that requires more upfront planning. So you want to go into it eyes wide open, knowing that I can get something running today, but next week it might come back to bite me. So day zero, usually you need to stand up your network environments, whether that's an Amazon VPC or something in Google Cloud, or if you've got on-prem infrastructure. And then you need to figure out what are all the subnets, how, does it, how do I get everything talking to each other, deploy my databases, backing services. You need to have a fair bit of understanding as to what the requirements are of what you're trying to deploy, but you can approach it as, I just need to get this running, I'll figure everything else out later. So you're gonna be launching your servers. This is where Terraform, I think, does really well, is on these day zero concerns. If I just need to get something running, I need to be able to have this repeatable so that if I have to tear this whole thing down and build it up again, it's not a big problem. Where it does become a problem is on day one forward, where you say, oh, actually, this application that I've been running has some new requirement. I was using RDS, but now I need to have a queue service deployed. And you can probably hack that into your procedural logic. Everything will keep working. But as you get more and more of these additional requirements, things just start to snowball. You have brittle code. Things break. I mean, we're all testing our infrastructure code, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, being able to replicate those environments where you say, okay, this is working well, but maybe now I need to deploy this again for a different customer that has stringent re compliance requirements that means that I can't have all of their servers in the same network as a different company. So you need to be able to figure out a way to make sure that the code that you write is reusable, composable, and something that you can extend when the need arises. So the way that you do that is first, you need to identify your abstractions. What is it that I'm thinking about when I'm architecting this piece of code? How am I identifying how everything ties together? So if it's procedural logic, you've got everything in one file, you can just use local variables, you can say this ties to this. You know, things like Terraform, Ansible, they all have ways of managing those linkages. But you need to think about it more from a software architecture or a domain modeling approach of the abstraction is maybe the entirety of this service. It's not just a server and a database and a queue and maybe an S3 bucket. It's all of those things working in concert as a single deployable artifact that I need to be able to reason about and evolve as those things change. As the application grows in complexity and needs more capabilities or I need to be able to expand the pool of servers or resize them. That's where having a good data model defined makes it easier because you can say, okay, the size of the server, that's an input variable that I can define in my data model. The number of servers is an input variable I can define in my data model. 
And thinking about it from the data first perspective makes it easier to modularize the code where you just say this piece of code takes these inputs and then I can reuse it anywhere. So you can deploy your QA environment, you can deploy your production environment, you can deploy another production environment for a different customer. And the other thing to be aware of as you're defining these abstractions and these data models is that you need to be able to revisit and refactor it periodically because the only constant in our work is change. So having a statically defined data model isn't going to do you any good if it stops being applicable to your actual requirements. So you need to go back and say, does this assumption that I made on you know, week three of this infrastructure still make sense three years later? And that's where a lot of problems crop up is because we're not thinking ahead enough about how all of this plays together in the long term. So as I said, the way to modularize is you parameterize your code by taking this data model as an input rather than having it be hard-coded in line with the rest of your logic or having it be a computed value based on those initial inputs. You want to be able to have a high-level view at the outset of this is all the information that I need to know about to understand what's actually running. Because once you hit deploy, you can go back to your AWS console or your Google Cloud console and see what all is running, but it's not necessarily going to tell you what actually talks to what, what you need to know to understand the big picture of the entire service from an end user perspective as to how it's actually going to function. Another thing that's useful for making it modular, if you don't bring this in from day one, is that you need to identify the seams of your infrastructure. So those seams might be vertical, where you have an abstraction along your application boundaries, where an application needs a database and an object storage bucket and a queue, and it needs to be in this VPC. Or it can be a horizontal seam, where you say, I've got a seam along all of my VPCs. They all need to be able to have DHCP set up. They need to be able to have public internet access. And then at another layer, you've got databases they all need to be configured so that they're not using the default parameter group so that I can change that down the road rather without having to reboot. And then as you add new capabilities and new services, try to encapsulate them in a component that you can compose with other infrastructure so that you're not saying, okay, well, I already have this block of code. It gives me the application and all the different services. I need to add this new thing to it. I'm just gonna jam it into this file everything's great until you need to use it for a different service. Then you have to say, okay, well, I'm just gonna copy pasta this over here, and that's when things start going terribly wrong, and you have no idea what's supposed to do what anymore, where your source of truth is. Treat it all as a software artifact. Treat it as a independently reasonable piece of logic so that you can say, this component is usable here, I plug it into this data model, it then talks to all these other services because I understand at a high level how it's all supposed to fit together. So for a bit of story time, this all comes from some painful lessons that we had to learn in our work where one of the things that we do is we run the OpenEdX platform, which is a fairly complex piece of software, requires a lot of backing infrastructure. We got it running. Everything was fine, but then all of a sudden, oh, well, now we actually need to be able to deploy the next version while still supporting the version that we're currently running. So one option is deploy an entirely new environment, but when you have to run RDS and Mongo and RabbitMQ and console and whatever other services are necessary, that gets pretty expensive pretty quick if all you want to do is be able to test out a new set of changes. So what we ended up doing was actually retrofitting a domain model into our infrastructure to say, actually, this needs a logical schema. It doesn't have to be a completely different piece of hardware. So we said, okay, we're going to come up with this idea of purposes, where this application serves this purpose of the current deployed edX uh, environment, and then the other purpose for this one is the next QA environment. So we were able to bring that in and thread that through all of our deployment logic to say, okay, now we can run just a different set of application servers talking to the same physical backends with different logical schemas. 
so that we can reduce cost and increase our overall velocity of being able to bring in these changes, test them out, verify that everything's working. And then when we're happy with it, we just change the purpose and we deploy it to the other set of servers. It didn't always fit great with the other applications that we either were running or that we ended up having to run. So that was where having to retrofit this domain model came into play and where I started to wish I had been thinking about this from day zero. Because once your code is there, it's hard to be able to be sure that everything is going to work as it's supposed to, since you already have statefully deployed services, you can't just say, okay, I, you know, I forgot to think about this, so I'm just gonna completely tear down this environment, destroy the database, and then rebuild it from scratch because there is inherent state in all of that. Not even just databases, but the application servers that you're running, the S3 buckets that you've got, that's all state. Some of it might be something that we can rebuild easily, but there's still a certain amount of cost involved, not necessarily just monetary, but in terms of your attention, and your ability to comprehend what exactly is going on, where you want to be able to evolve the schema to add new things or deprecate old things, but you don't necessarily want to just tear everything down and then rebuild it from the ground up because that's not always a viable approach. So that actually did end up leading to us needing to recreate an entire environment for production because these domain models that we came up with didn't map cleanly into how things had been before we started going down this approach. Fortunately, we were able to have some planned downtime, but having to migrate the entire environment to a new schema, new way to think about everything, meant a longer downtime than we had planned because we had to replicate the whole database over where we couldn't just easily snapshot and then recreate. We needed to actually pipe it from one database to another. And then as we kept going, we were saying, okay, well, purposes are working great. We're starting to factor those into our other applications where we can map it to a logical concept of this application serves this purpose, whether it's QA or production. In our case, we had the additional complexity between QA and next QA of our edX deployments where one set of servers was for a staging environment, both in QA and production, and then there was a live environment so that professors can create their content in one set of servers and then copy it over to the other one for students to actually take advantage of. So there are a lot of different dimensions and axes to be thinking about to make sure that all of the services were talking to the right sets of backends, that we were able to understand how everything tied together, and then also be able to carry that forward into production. Recently, we ended up having to deploy an entirely new environment of edX servers for a different product line and so we had said, okay, well, it's not just about purposes and it's not just about environments. We also have different business units that we need to be thinking about. So that's another axis of our dimensionality that we had to incur as far as just overall complexity. So, yeah. <laughs> that's where you need to be careful. Having you, know, you, you can create your domain model and you say, oh, I've got this attribute, great, okay, now I'm gonna add another one and another one, and each one of those different attributes increases the complexity of your environment and the complexity of your logic exponentially, where you say, okay, if I change this attribute and this attribute, it's not just I have two different ways that I can think about it, you've got four and so on and so forth. So you wanna be able to limit the number of attributes that factor into the high level of how your application environments work together so that you don't drive yourself mad trying to figure out what's the entire vector space that I have to be thinking about. So as I said, we added in business units when we already had separate environments with different roles, roles being things like application server, worker, queues, and then we added the purpose, so now we've got four different dimensions to be reasoning about, and it took a lot of refactoring and thinking to make sure that we didn't break everything that was already running while still being able to support new services. So where we are now, we've got four dimensions in our, business, in our domain model, and the thing that really helped us carry this forward is we extracted all of the necessary information into an environments file where we can say this environment has these different services. So that's where we define our RDS databases. 
that goes into, like that acts as input into an orchestration file that will create the databases for us. So we don't have to say, I'm creating a database for this service, so now I need to think about what are all the different parameters because we've already got it defined ahead of time. We just say, create this, uh, you know, fill out this data model with all the different attributes that it needs. We run this script. It makes sure we have all the databases that are supposed to exist. They're all connected to Vault. They're all listening on the proper ports. They've got the proper user permissions set up. And so having that high level view makes it a lot easier for us to understand when we go into the AWS console what everything really means because we can say, okay, it's this environment for this purpose. They all talk to these things. All of the code that we've written is very data driven. So we don't rely on saying, okay, I need to make a change. I'm going to copy this file over, make a couple of changes to it, and then that will live as its own separate artifact because then you get drift. You, make, you don't have the same logic running everywhere. So we lean heavily on data inputs. So pretty much every tool that we're using has that capability. So Terraform has user bears that you can create. We use the pillar system in SaltStack. Ansible has its own VARES capabilities. So you wanna make sure that you encapsulate all of your critical domain in those variables so that you can compose them together. So one of the nice things with pillar data, I'm not sure exactly how it works on all the other tools, is that it has a hierarchical flow where you can say, I'm gonna define the base set of information that I need, then I'm gonna overlay this other environment. It will override the attributes that overlap, but at the end I'm going to have the entire sort of meshed set of data. So it makes it much easier to create different environments with slightly different use cases without having to change any of our code. We just make sure that the data model stays up to date. The problem that we've got now is that our abstractions are starting to leak because we didn't define the data model at the outset. We're starting to have to say, okay, so for databases we have this set of information that we need for S3 buckets. At first, it was we just need this set of information, but then as applications, so I, actually I need three different buckets, then st things start to become difficult to manage. They don't quite fit into the way that we were doing things, and that's where this revisit and refactor step comes into play. So the next thing that we need to do is identify what actually is the critical abstraction that we're dealing with now, where before it was more around the service level of databases, queues, caches, applications. We want to be a bit more holistic about it where we say we actually have an application. So an application might just be a database in a queue for some cases, or it might be a set of EC2 servers, it might be a database, some S3 buckets, how do we think about that as a single unit so that we can tie everything together so that we're not having bespoke changes? So we initially created our domain model and then as new requirements came up, we would say, okay, well, we'll just add another attribute to it, factor that into our code, and we've been able to push the boundaries further by doing that, but there are cases where it doesn't quite map up. So now we have some cases where in Vault, for instance, they changed some of their expectations of their model, so we have to have some workarounds to say, in some cases, Postgres databases are identified as Postgres, sometimes Postgres QL. How do we encapsulate that without having to rewrite everything? So we say, okay, well now we have to add that that's the actual attribute that we're pulling in of this one's Postgres, this one's Postgres QL, you know, this one's MySQL or MariaDB. And being able to not have to have all of those different random attributes that we add in just to gimp along. We want to revisit and refactor our overall logic to say this is what we actually care about of an application boundary. So we're trying to go along the vertical seams. Another thing is that because edX was one of the first services that we had to manage using our infrastructure automation, it sort of leaked into everything else that we were doing and so now a decent portion of our core code base for infrastructure is dedicated to just edX. And so we need to be able to break that out into its own component so that we can deploy that as its own thing without necessarily having that wend its way through the rest of our code base accidentally. So we need to figure out what are all the points, what are all the assumptions that we made about this environment, about this application, 
that are solely applicable to that so that we can capture that logic separately, pull it into its own module. And that will also make it more useful for other people because as I mentioned in one of my past talks, everything that we do is open source. So our infrastructure is publicly visible in terms of how we manage it. So by factoring edX into its own component, anybody else who needs to run it will be more able to use the work that we've done, whereas right now it's fairly tightly coupled to the specifics of our environment. The other thing is that we want to add more helper code to encapsulate some of those edge cases of tying together different application environments where we might need to run something in three or four different stages to be able to get a fully operational environment, we want to be able to just run it in one. So we need to be able to create logic that ties together those different domain models, pulls it all into the, a, an artifact that we can deploy without having to track each stage and make sure that we're doing it manually. So one of the things that definitely worked well for us is being able to have that multi-tenant environment for our edX environments where we could say we have our current set of instances that we're maintaining because that's what's running in production. This is the version that we're going to be deploying next. And then we are actually able to extend it beyond just the initial requirement to say we're also going to try deploying the master branch so that we can get forewarning of things that are coming down the pike or we need to be able to run isolated sandbox instances that are actually just for coupling to an application that we're developing. So by having this domain model of this is what an edX environment needs, this is all the different services that it talks to, we were able to reuse that in multiple different ways beyond just what the initial requirements were. Whereas if we were to try and just do it all procedurally, it would have been a lot more painful. As I mentioned, we also use Vault pretty heavily for our secrets management. And so when we were defining the way that we were laying out the different paths and the different mount points, we had already started establishing our domain model, which made it a lot easier to reason about how is this going to evolve in the future to make sure that we don't just have a bunch of random paths that don't really make any semantic sense. So we said pretty early on, Every mount point is going to be mapped to a specific business unit and an environment. And then within those mount points, we're going to say, this applies to either globally or separate environments. And then we pull in the purpose data as well. So if you need to know what's the secret key for a Django application, you know it's going to be in secret dash micromasters slash QA slash uh, you know, Django XYZ rather than just having to go hunting and pecking through the entire set of paths that might exist in Vault. And then, as I said before, having that high-level document of the environments file has really simplified our ability to understand what is it that we need to be able to get a new deployment running, because we can see what we've already got, we can see what's actually, in, uh, what's actually present. One of the challenges is that if we do make modifications in an ad hoc basis to a running server, we need to be able to reflect that back to that file. So we just have to make sure that we have a good amount of diligence to say, okay, this application instance is actually going from a T3 large to an R4 large. So we just need to commit that into our code so that the code is actually representative of what's running in production. Because otherwise you get a lot of confusion as you say, well, this environment file says T3 large, I need to redeploy it. And then actually it fell over because there aren't enough resources. Another thing that we learned in the process of going through all of this is that you need to be very consistent in how you name things and any suffixes or prefixes. So for a while, production environments didn't have any suffix because they were sort of the canonical source of what we wanted. But then QA or our release candidate environments would have a dash RC or a dash CI so that when we're writing our code, it actually becomes pretty painful to, to say, I'm actually gonna pull in this suffix for these environments, but then with prod, do I just pull in an empty string? Do I have a conditional case that special cases it? Whereas if we had thought about it ahead of time, we would have said, okay, well actually all prod environments are going to have dash prod. And then it's easier when you're looking in the AWS console to know that's production, not just something. 
And also, it reduces the overall complexity of our logic to be able to say, I'm just going to pull in a suffix. I don't have to care about which case it's addressing. It's just pulling in the data. That's all I care about right now. The other thing is, don't make too many assumptions about what one application is going to need because you're guaranteed to have something completely bespoke for the next thing. So for instance, when we had to deploy this second entirely separate edX environment for a different business unit, it was pretty painful because a lot of the configuration data that we had that applied to the set of servers that were used by students had leaked into the overall mapping of this is what an edX environment is, when in reality, we actually didn't want half of those feature flags that were turned on. So we needed to be able to pull those apart into separate files, figure out what is the actual base set of information that we need just to get something running, and then these are the pieces that are actually specific to these different environments so that we can then compose it all up into a single set of information to deploy one of those instances. Identifying and paying down modeling debt, as well as just general technical debt, has been absolutely crucial for our ability to continue to build and scale new services because there have been any number of times, for instance, when we were introducing purposes, where if we hadn't done that, then we would have just been accruing too much technical debt where any change would have been too risky. It would have taken us months to get something new into production. Whereas by being diligent and identifying that the way that we're approaching this right now isn't going to work for the thing that I'm trying to do today. So rather than just trying to bull forward and get something functional, we need to actually take the time to refactor refactor it so that it addresses all of my needs today and try and identify potential use cases for tomorrow so that you're not caught, so you're not blindsided when those changes do come down. And then in terms of the dimensionality of your attributes, it's definitely necessary to try and identify attributes that have a hierarchical relation to them because if they're all just many to many, then the complexity becomes too much to deal with, whereas by having things a bit more hierarchical in terms of a business unit has a set of environments, has a set of applications that might have different purposes, each time you scope into one of those attributes, it eliminates a certain set of the other possible values for the attributes that you're then going to go to so that you don't just have a Cartesian explosion of what are all the different problem spaces I'm going to be dealing with. And the other thing that we learned is that retrofitting a domain model is hard. <laughs> Having to do it after the fact, after you've already got services running, after you've already got code committed that's doing what you want it to do, being able to go back and say, actually, I need to pull out all of this information into a separate artifact that I can see and reason about and evolve, it's just a lot of work. So trying to identify that early on, trying to establish the necessary abstractions as early as possible reduces a lot of potential pain and bugs down the road. So if anybody's interested, you can find me online at a bunch of different places. Uh, as Laura said at the opening, I run the tech ops team at Open Learning. Uh, I run Boundless Notions LLC. If you're ever looking for information about sort of the overall space of data engineering and data infrastructure, and I run a couple of podcasts if that's something that you're into. And you can also find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, I'll also be running an open space at one o'clock this afternoon to talk more about this whole idea of domain modeling and treating your infrastructure as a data problem and not just a code problem. And a couple of in, uh, references that might be useful to understand a bit about what I was talking about. So the environments file that I was referencing, it's all open source. You can see the current state of it at that GitHub link. Uh, and then an example of a data-driven approach to managing the infrastructure is the code that we use for managing RDS deployments that actually pulls information from that environments file and then runs it against Amazon where it will say, you know, this instance is already there, I don't need to make any changes, this instance doesn't exist yet, so I'm going to go ahead and deploy it. All right, so looks like I might have a few minutes for questions. No minutes for questions. Oh, no minutes for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Find me at the open space. Cool, thank you, Tobias.